We have Morgan Grover as an adjunct instructor and researcher at the University of Alaska, Anchorage. Her research interests have focused on the late pre-contact and early historic periods in Alaska, particularly how new goods were integrated into existing systems and how these goods and technology spread through indigenous networks. Daniel Thompson, who I've worked with with the NEVA project, is an archaeologist with over two decades studying colonial era archaeological sites in Alaska. He is a specialist in Russian of ceramics and materials culture, working on significant Russian excavations at Castle Hill, the Kenai River, and most re recently, uh, the National Science Foundation and Sika Historical Society research uh, of the Neva shipwreck site on Kruzov Island. Please welcome Margan and Dan. Hi. <laughs> thank, we were like, wait, should I start? Should you start? <laughs> um, yeah, and oh, uh, one more thing. We're married. So uh, this, this presentation should go about as you would expect from a married couple who have been I'm together. Right here. I'm right here. I'm standing <laughs> next to you. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, thanks for having us, everybody. We are just so excited to be back in Sitka. We've, we've been back multiple times since we did the excavation at Castle Hill, but um, I, just every time is just so, it's like, it's, it's, it's like coming home. Um, we, we worked on the Castle Hill site in 1997 and 1998 uh, when we were both graduate students. <laughs> and uh, um, it was, what was it, our thir second or third year in Alaska. So not only uh, were we young, <laughs> But we were, we were also still kind of new, hi, Ginia, to, uh, to Alaska. So Sitka, in a way, is like part of our uh, love for this, for this place that we get to live in. So that's really wonderful. Did you want to ask your question before no, I start? You're doing great. Um, yeah, I just want to say, so she was talking about us coming to Alaska. Um, I worked for years, um, before about 10 years prior to that, in New York State, uh, Virginia, other places. When I came here, I was lucky to come on this archaeological site that dated to the same time period as these other places, but I saw immediately something was different. Something was markedly different from any other types of colonial sites I'd seen, and we'll talk about that a little bit today. But that was what I knew there was something that would spark my interest for years, and it continues to. But um, the Russian-American experience in North America is pretty unique, um, and I think we'll see that. Yeah, and we wanted to, uh, to check real quick. Um, who was here in 1997 and 1998 and was able to, yay, <laughs> great. We might end up boring you then with some of the information you already know. We're not going to spend a, a lot, a lot of time, but uh, it was 20 years ago, and you know, so maybe it'll be a nice refresher for you you too. A lot of them were here. That's yeah. great. Yeah. All we saw was white shoes because yeah. we were down in our pits and we would see those cruise ships land and there'd be a thousand white shoes. We never saw your faces. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. We, we better get going. Right. So, uh, um, so you're all familiar with this place. Um, you, you might remember that the project that we did at Castle Hill actually started in 1995 when, uh, the uh, state of Alaska was planning on doing all sorts of improvements around the Sitka National, or the uh, Castle Hill uh, State Historic Park. I almost said Sitka National Historic Park. Um, and one of those things was paving the parking lot, right? Uh, the other thing was they needed to build a wheelchair accessible ramp up to the top of the, of the hill. Uh, Castle Hill was listed as a National Historic Landmark in 1962, and it's a very important archaeological site, but nobody had done much in the way of figuring out what type of archaeology was at the site. And a lot of archaeological work uh, we thought would be uh, focused on the top of the hill where the castle, um, the castle in quotes, stood. So in 1995, we came out and we did some testing. and. Uh, I'll, we'll get more into that in just a second, but there wasn't much there. And then in 1997, we came back because they had finalized the plans for the wheelchair accessible ramp uh, and uh, for the new interpretive panels. And we started testing uh, in a lower area. Here, I have a little pointer. 
let's get the right end. Oh, there it is. So we started kind of focusing in on this area down here. You'll see a map in a minute. And, um, and we found some really incredible intact deposits uh, that we were able to act. Uh, th this was an unprecedented collection of 19th century Russian period materials. In fact, it's the largest collection of Russian American materials in the state. This is a very famous illustration of, uh, of Castle Hill. This is an early illustration uh, from Lysiansky in 1805. Uh, what isn't talked about, uh, or at least in, um, when we first came here, was that there were actually clan houses that were at the top of the hill before the Russians arrived. Uh, New Clean, it was the name of the hill in uh, Clinket, and it means big fort. And that, those buildings uh, stood there until 1804. Uh, it was a really great place. There was actually clan houses from multiple clans there. There was uh, the On the Point House, inside the Fort House, Herring Flutter House, and the Sun House. So there were four of them up there, representing different clans in the community. And then the 1804 battle happened, and uh, the, you know that whole story. It's a long um, story. We, we don't have time to cover it, so I'm unfortunately going to skip it. But after uh, the Battle of Sitka in 1804, the Russian-American Company founded the settlement of, of New Archangel here, and it focused around Castle Hill, at least initially. In 1805, when Lidzansky made this drawing, he described this, uh, the community, and he said there were eight very fine buildings um, that were finished, <laughs> the ones that were finished. And uh, there was just enough uh, ground that was being cultivated that there were 15 kitchen gardens, 15. Uh, also from 1805, Rezanov said uh, he was more specific. He said halfway up the hill, there was a barracks, two turrets, they, those were log. Um, there was a storage building, this is in other areas of the, of the town, a storage building, warehouse, cellars, a, a shed with posts and a workshop underneath it, a large warehouse and store. I have, this is a very long, da, da, da. blah, 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 yeah. Uh, endless <laughs> amount of buildings. Bathhouses, barns, blacksmith shops, and of course what they call yurts for the native workers. Uh, and there was also cannons at the top of the hill in 1804. <clears throat> so you can see that Castle Hill isn't the only place where there was Russian development, even a year, within a year of the, of the Battle of Sitka. Yeah, I just want to back up and also talk about, you know, Morgan's a professor. She teaches all around the state and talks about world cultures. And something I never thought about um, when I was there, because we get so focused on the Russian period, is kind of that, what happened at that moment? Why did they choose Castle Hill to put the administrative capital, um, the, um, the, the chief manager's house, et cetera? It was a promontory. It was the largest hill in town. Um, and, and in a way, we've looked at sort of our anthropology, we look at culture context all around the world, and we see the same pattern after town after town. Uh, you know, the vanquished people are removed physically from the landscape, and they oftentimes the, 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 con the, the folks who are con conquering them will plop themselves right down in that most sacred place. And so I think it wasn't just that they wanted to have cannons to signal to American traders later that the Russians had control over this harbor or the bay, but also to send a, an unfortunate and kind of dark message that uh, they had taken, at least for the time being, um, some control over the, you know, the future. It's just one way to look at it. Totally, yeah. Yeah. This is a great map. Um, it, this, this map is from Langsdorf, and it's 1805, so this is right around that same time period. And I know it's kind of blurry, but this is the most high-resolution version I could find. Uh, here's Castle Hill right here, and you can see even in 1805, it's surrounded by, um, you know, by a wall. There's, these are where the, the cannons were. This A right here is the governor's house. This, is a, uh, this was a log structure on a rock foundation in it. And this is the one that lasted until after Baranov left. So this is not, this log building that we don't have a, a good image of is Baranov's castle. <laughs> um, and then, uh, but more importantly, this is where we were excavating right here. <clears throat> 
So uh, that was actually labeled F, uh, which you probably can't read. I can't either. It's okay. And that was uh, called the Commander's Bathhouse. After Baranov left in 1818, there was a flurry of construction and all sorts of things happened. Um, this is when the new chief manager's house was built, which you see the photos of. Um, it stood until 1894. Uh, let's see. Well, I forgot what else I was going to say. Oh, yeah. Um, the, what's Im kind of important to note is that there was a a description of, of the community in 1830, and you see this over and over again, that buildings were falling apart. In fact, they made a list of the buildings that were falling apart. Stores, workshops, blacksmith shops, uh, generals, kitchens, stables, alute houses, uh, sheds, all sorts of buildings, which is a problem. I, I'll interject. In uh, the late 1830s, Edelin uh, was one of the first managers who made a concerted effort to require or at least suggest strongly that buildings be built with stone footings uh, because uh, prior to that most of the buildings were built on grade on soil and i don't know how that went but they estimated about a 20-year lifespan for an average log building before they the lower courses had to be removed or the whole building was torn down right yeah <laughs> it explains a little of why there is such a succession of building going on in a short amount of time. And you'll see that in a minute when we tell you about what we found, because in this little tiny area, uh, we found the foundations of a, a whole m amazing array of buildings. But here's the drawing, um, and we think th these are the buildings, some of the buildings that we were excavating. And this is from 1827. So these would have been illustrations of the actual, some of the actual buildings. So you all know that in 1867, the transfer of Alaska happened. Happy 150th, yay. Um, and uh, that took place apparently on top of the hill, probably in one of these uh, clearings, oops, uh, oh, there it goes, um, probably in, I'm imagining in front of the building uh, here or on the other side um, that's facing away from us. And uh, this, this building continued to stand um, until it burned down, General Jefferson C. C. Davis. Davis. <laughs> to be confused. Uh, stayed here and he used it as his headquarters when the army was here. But the army left in 1877 and, and uh, the building was used by the signal service and uh, then they were going to um, refurbish the building. They were doing a great job of it and in 1894 it, it caught fire which is what the picture on the top left is. I, I don't know if, we, if they've identified the photographer yet from this. Somebody can let me know. I haven't seen it. It's a, it's a, what a moment to catch, right, um, in, in a photograph. The Department of Agriculture rebuilt uh, here, and, and they started to move into the building in 1898. And that's the picture you see right here. This is the one I'm told that a lot of people picture when they think of Baranov's castle. Baranov had been dead for, what, 80 years when this building was built. <laughs> and it played a pretty important role. The uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture had uh, testing stations throughout Alaska from McGrath and uh, Kenai and down here. Um, it actually did play a pretty big role in developing our agriculture we see today. And I th it, some people say it led to uh, FDR's decision to bring to develop the, the Matanuska colony later. Um, you know, they were, it was a proving ground for testing the potatoes and the wheat and all those kind of crops that are important economically. So, I mean, just because, it, you know, it's American period and it's not Brahms Castle, it's actually a pretty significant building. Who, I don't, Jefferson's Castle? Should we rename it? No. Okay. Yeah. Brahms sounds better. But notice, here's the bench where we did our excavations right here. And there's no structures that show up in this photo from the 1940s at all. Um, this building was torn down in 1955. It was turned into a park in 1959. Some of you were here and uh, you, you attended the official raising of the, of the flag, the first United States flag at the top of the hill. Uh, in the 1960s, they placed a whole bunch of fill around the bottom of the hill. And this is one of the few glimpses we have about things that were happening in places other than the top of the hill. So it's a little bit of information. The hill 
uh, top was also landscaped in the 1960s, which some of you were here to witness as well. And that's when um, the wall that you see on the right-hand picture was built. Uh, I, I learned today that there was a wall there before, but it was replaced apparently, I think, in the 1960s. So since some of those very early, like 19, 1830s ac Russian accounts, we don't know a lot about what was happening um, other than a few drawings or illustrations about activity around the base of Castle Hill. And sadly, when we looked into the archaeology, there wasn't a lot of intact archaeology at the top of the hill. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, showing on the right um, in different colors, all the different kind of testing we did, you know, excavations um, over three years. So in 1995, like we talked about before, we did dug on the top of the hill. That's the focus of all activity. We had the most records, and it was a mess. I mean, there are significant artifacts up there even today. Um, on the left, you can see what it looks like, but it's just been bulldozed over and over and over again. So basically, you have 150 years of all activity mixed into one or two components. So we can't really say anything about people individually, any individual groups of people, the army's component or the Russian component, that's all mixed up. So we were discouraged and somebody had the great idea, let's start digging on the side of the hill. So we did and that's um, one of the more significant early finds was um, do you want this or it's, should I do it? It's up by can B, I, can I B do it? on the side of the hill. B, that's this right. Left, left, oh, left, 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 left. Right Oh, shoot, yeah, you're uh, right. Here we found our first that evidence of pre-contact uh, clinket archaeology, intact. Uh, what we found were layers of uh, uh, sea mammal bone, shell, and uh, ground slate point, and charcoal. And the charcoal we carbon dated, and we had a number of dates. The oldest is 990 AD, so we have a 1,000 years of archaeology up there. Now granted, we only did a little bit of work, and I would say that in the future that might actually be worth uh, revisiting, because it's still intact. We were, uh, we would just poked around in there right. earlier yeah. today. <laughs> yeah, we walked up there to see if anything eroded it out, nothing had. Um, but that wasn't the focus of the trail that was being built, so we're not out to make more work and cost people money, we're there to do a you know, provide a product for a client, which was the state of Alaska. We have a trail going in. Let's test where the trail is going in to see if there's impacts. Yeah. Yeah. So we started digging. Um, our budget was nothing. Uh, the first unit in, we ran in the, in the upper left is this brick platform, uh, which in retrospect is, uh, we've confirmed, is, a, is probably a stove base for a... Uh, for a wood stove. Um, but in, it wasn't just that, there were lines of uh, structural remains and walls started to develop and then the far right you can see some of the lines of the building walls. I mean it's a slow process when you're doing this kind of work. You start in a little telephone booth and we ended up opening up these big wide areas to see what's going on. Um, this was a, actually um, probably of, of all the buildings, this is one of the more interesting, it, we were able to reconstruct from the artifacts inside that this was housing for an early Russian American household. Probably a um, barracks or workers housing of un, some unknown kind. Now at this point in the project we didn't know who was living here yet. So this is, you know, we're gathering the data, what do we have? So what do we have, this is an example Evidence of children. This is a the miniature musket carved out of spruce. And the, oh, you touched the screen. Didn't um, you? As, in the upper right are small Napoleonic toy cannons, uh, gun parts, smoking pipes, um, and in this middle, it, you probably all recognize this, a garnet, right? Um, but the garnet, the size of something that would fit into a, a of a firearm, and as we poured through our records, we found that uh, there were a lot of reports from the early 19th century of the local folks using those for hunting. This is, you know, this is before the, the, the steamship and the wrangle trade and the tourist trade. So this is, these weren't being sold to tourists, these were being used by people. Um, and they were following the guns. And that with the gun parts, we think we have, you know, um, pretty good evidence of, of, of that activity. We thought it was, thought it was over. Below building one was building two, which again, I will say is probably the most significant building. <laughs> because it is. This is the only example we have of a, 
early 19th century Russian blacksmith shop in all of North America. And, and it's complete. It's, a, it's an it entirety is. of a blacksmith shop. Yeah. Uh, see, what's going on is these people, you know, after the buildings decay, they're abandoned for a couple of three years or get filled in, and then you just build on top of it. So it's preserving these floors. I mean, we're not in finding roofs in these buildings, obviously, but we're, we're finding um, piles of artifacts in the corner that were left behind. The, uh, in the lower left is the base of a blacksmith's forge. And to even pick through here with a trowel, the tool of our choice, uh, it was like concrete. It was all metalworking slag and melted copper and all these objects we started to find. Um, not a lot of stuff from, you know, you'd think around your table in your, in your kitchen, but mostly huge piles of different materials, like, uh, like, like objects of the same material from all over the whole industries. I mean, from the maritime trade we had, or the maritime um, artifacts, we had piles of, of block pulleys from the ringing with copper centers. We had piles of copper ship snails. Um, I'll go back, I'll go forward a little. And the biggest collection of Russian uh, uh, seals from, from the bales of fur that they were shipping. Now, they only, prior to this project, there only been three or four of these found, I think. In Kodiak. In Kodiak. Mm -hmm. And here we had, I don't know, it was two dozen or two or more. So what we saw was going on here when we started uh, was, this is the blacksmith shop where they're casting materials because we started finding these in the far left. This is exciting. Casts of all these objects they're making. So what they're doing is these blacksmiths are gathering up and recycling materials from all over at Sitka to repurpose and then recast. So pretty exciting. and. And again, this hasn't even been looked at hardly. This, we've only scratched the surface on the analysis, and that's something for a future grad student. <laughs> OK, so moving through this flurry of activity, we moved into to the north. And to the north, we weren't really that surprised. There was more. <laughs> what we found was another building. This one, probably around the same time as the second. And I'm sorry I didn't mention time frames. We were able to date these buildings from artifacts to roughly 1805 to 1840 with a little variation. Um, this building, Building 3, was um, full of just incredible surprises. Um, another brick platform on the upper left, some sort of uh, honing feature we don't know what it is but that stone has been used for grinding and i think finishing tools well dave dave mcmahon thought that it was an anvil base well isn't this the one he thought was an anvil base we're we're not in total agreement about that what that is uh oh so. here is the marriage well no i mean there's <laughs> yeah. there's there's striations from like you know if you're uh working on metal and you want to clean up an edge you're going to have to have some sort of ba uh grinding stone to Okay. And we can go, we can talk about this at home. Yeah, talk about the yeah. And on the far right, this is really amazing. What does that look like to you? They yeah, that's kind they of might rough. not know. It's a it's a log um, drain that was built into the floor. It's like a gutter. Yeah, but built in the floor. In the floor, yeah. Yeah, and this is this is a medieval technology. We found the only place we could find on the planet where we found this is Estonia, which isn't surprising, right? You have a little knowledge of Russian history. Estonia was, you know, part of a significant part of uh, Russia's um, Russian American workers here. This is what we're talking. I'm sorry, I just realized we're pointing. He's pointing at the screen. I'm thinking you can see it. Oh, this right. is what we're talking about right here. Yeah. So, so again, another really unique um, um, workshop feature. And in this one, of course, the activities have changed. Here we had finished products, all in all sheet copper. So they were not using it as a blacksmith shop, nor were they using it for um, casting. They were actually sheet metal workers, specifically. And we found, this is just a sample, uh, uh, kettles, just dozens of kettle lugs, all sorts. Basically, is anything that was made out of copper in Russian America was probably made here at some point, or at least part of it. These are uh, copper rings. There's uh, chisels. I think this was the one with a cat, a cache of chisels in it, wasn't it? Oh, okay. Um, these are the lugs from kettles right here. 
And the lower right doesn't look like much, but those are trimmings. If you have a square feet sheet of copper and you're trimming it to make a round vessel, um, these come off. And we found pounds and pounds of that. So uh, the last building was not as exciting archaeologically as the first three, but we were able to do a little with this. And we found um, a log structure on grade with just about one artifact type, human hair. Right? Human hair. Piles and piles of human hair. Disgusting, but it was there. That was so much fun to excavate. So, yeah. since then, we have learned, of course, about the bathhouses that were in Sitka. And we're pretty, pretty certain that this is one of the bathhouses. We don't have all the information because, unfortunately, part of this building was destroyed by construction um, in the early park days, Alaska State Park days. Um, but we its position on the hill after we did all these maps matches this one particular building that was photographed in 1889. So, and it was really fun for us because using archaeological sleuthing, we had all these ideas of how big it was and its dimensions and how it was built and its orientation and it all matched. So that made us feel a little bit more confident about ourselves and what we'd been finding. You want me to? Okay. Yeah. He's getting tired. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. So, uh, just going through some of those slides, we talked about the buildings, we showed you some quick pictures of artifacts. You saw some of the stuff that um, is typical, in a way, of, of archaeology. But there was a lot of really unique material culture or artifacts that were recovered at, at this site. And some of it is evidence of the everyday life of the people who were living and working in these structures. So uh, what's really cool about it is that not only do we have household activities, but we have this um, evidence of people doing manufacturing and, um, and recycling of materials mixed in on, at times with acti other activities. We've got um, evidence of hunting, there were gun flints, lead shot, uh, ground slate projectile points, bola weights, um, there was an obsidi obsidian nodule, there's of course beads and buttons, uh, there was this 1748 Kopec, uh, oops I keep turning this around, which is down, oh come on, there were several pointer. of them, they're it's, actually really interesting, I think the battery's dying, it's I'm the bottom collector. left picture, sorry about that, can I talk about coins? I guess, briefly. Well, okay, uh, coins in Russian America were exceptionally rare. Um, most co uh, currency exchange was going on in company stores. We had a ledger, and you were on the hook for the whole season based on, uh, you know, uh, that book. But when you had to exchange small items, the Russians just didn't have coinage here until much later. So um, of all the coins that were found at Castle Hill, they're always 1748, co these Kopecks. And we think that they shipped over a whole cask of old coinage, and they just used that for little, little things. Great. Um, and they also had, instead of dollars, they had their own script, which looked like, kind of like the Confederate dollars, um, only good for them. But it was printed on uh, seal hides. And uh, they look like dollars, but those don't preserve in the archaeological record, normally. Normally. We're not trying to like tell you that we found one. That was the one thing we kept hoping we would find, and we never found one. We were really hoping for it. Um, there was uh, gaming pieces, doll parts. There's samovar parts. For those of you who are familiar with old samovars, the picture in the middle um, are parts from a samovar. These uh, chandelier crystals on the left are actually found inside of the structures at the at the base of the hill, and what we think is that people were salvaging them from the furnishings uh, in the buildings at the top of the hill. So as they, uh, as they you know, replaced fixtures and, and improved the furnishings inside of the governor's house, they would, uh, they would hand out um, the, the, um, the dishes and, and um, little things from the house to people as rewards. And one of the things we think they were doing is handing out the crystals from like the chandeliers and the lamps and people turned them into jewelry. And we found a lot of those there. Uh, there's so many things here to show you. But we were just talking at dinner earlier. There's the sock. <laughs> this is one of the only complete pieces of clothing that we found at the site. That is an 18, you know, 30s period sock, Russian sock. You're welcome. 
<laughs> and then this um, top right thing is the drawing. I think this is the one, Thad. This, this is the one you had. Where's Thad? Yeah. Oh, there you are. You're right in front. Hi. Um, yeah, that's the one. Okay, good. We just found out at dinner earlier that a not expert in a not society has identified this as a modified uh, bowling bo bowl weight. Uh, bowling weight. Bowling not. Sorry. Brain is somewhere else. Um, it, but the guy who's an expert in knots has never seen a knot like this. So Thad proposed that we ca start calling it the Sitka knot. Or if it's a failure, we should call it the Spackman. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Sorry, Hal. Tough crowd. We love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, you want to talk about the triptych real quick? Cause real quick. Okay. We're going on too long. For, I mean, the role of the Russian... Uh, ex experience the Russian American company and how intertwined they were with the Orthodox Church was clearly found at Castle Hill. Um, the triptych panel you see in the upper, near almost upper right, was found in of all the things you it wouldn't believe it. One of the few things we found near the top of the hill were these huge, immense, 25 to 30 inch post holes that were part of the original palisade of the, the 1805 period that, you know, the initial Baratov's cancel had a, another palisade around it. And at the very base of these, we found triptych panels. This the, isn't only the only artifact in them. They were placed there intentionally as a blessing for this settlement. And that, I mean, that's powerful. And that really does show that connection between the church and this enterprise. And this isn't the only triptych panel we found. No, it's not, but that's an interesting uh, one. We, so when he says we found multiple, we did find multiple. This is just the only one we put the picture of up. So uh, the last thing that kind of got hinted at a few times here is the site preservation, because the entire site is, is, uh, is just one gigantic layer of wood chips. Woodworking seems to be something, it's either debris from construction of the buildings, more likely it has also to do with people making things out of wood. And this, the, all of these wood chips at the site, um, was it Rebecca? Rebecca Polson was going to look, she tried to bring some home and she was going to look at them, I think. Wasn't that Rebecca who was going to do it? Oh, do you remember that? <laughs> anyway, um, and, but this, this, uh, all of this uh, wood chips caused the pH level of the soil to be elevated and it allowed things that we rarely ever see at archaeological sites to be preserved. We had not just um, leather, we had textiles the hair that we talked about, um, ivory and bone, basketry, um, shell. We even found eggshell. You know that skin on the inside of the, of the shell? We found eggshell at the site. Move your hand. So this, um, this unusual preservation kind of gives us a hint at the, at the way that people were living um, and working at the sites and in, in a way that we don't normally find at other sites. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge collection, it's extensive. So this kind of begs the question, right? How did the Russian American company function in the world and how did people function and live at the site and what was their role? But one of the things that I, uh, we've talked about quite a bit is Sitka's called the Paris of the Pacific, right? Was Sitka the Paris of the Pacific? That's the first question that we want to address. All right. So, during uh, the early 19th, <laughs> pardon me, the early 19th century, the, the Sitka settlement was the largest and, and most cosmopolitan port in the North Pacific. That's why it's called the Paris of the Pacific. Sitka was a stopover for, for uh, traders who had been visiting Europe and Asia and Hawaii and settlements all along the west coast of North America. Before 1799, supplies that were coming into Russian America had to be shipped directly from Akotsk, um, usually using the uh, long or, uh, overland journey, right? After 1804, the... Uh, we think about Sitka, you hear all the time there's hardly any supply ships coming here. Those are Russian supply ships. Um, from what we can tell, there were lots of, uh, of foreign ships coming here for repairs, for trade. And um, 
So there, there, was, there was supply. It was just coming from foreign traders, not from the Russians. And between 1799 and 1839, there was increasing trade, especially with American vessels. We know that they were shipping cattle um, from the Russian post at Fort Ross from California, and grain too. And they were getting food and, and durable goods from Russia through the port of uh, Kronstadt. After 1839, the, the Russian-American company formed a trade agreement with the Hudson's Bay Company. And they got tons of goods, British goods, um, uh, through the Columbia River region. And then, after 1849, they started directly uh, purchasing goods from England, Germany, and then also, of course, you know, stuff from Russia. So, and the uh, gold rush. Oh, yes. You know, the, the gold rush in California. California, yes. Thank you, dear. Um, so the, the assemblage uh, is kind of giving us an opportunity to kind of reconsider some of uh, what our preconceived notions were about trade relations and life in the early 19th century. Uh, even though there was some dependence on the Russian colonies, on um, the British and the American traders, there were also some distinctly Russian um, items that were showing up in the Castle Hill collection. So we had uh, Russian uniform accoutrements, Russian coins, religious items, bottle seals, fur bale seals, things like that. But the diversity of goods that were showing up at the, at the site, at this workers' housing and, um, and work spaces, was really amazing. It was more abundant, more diverse than we really thought it could be, than we had previously considered. Yeah, this is sort of what Morgan was talking about in a physical way. I mean, uh, the upper right are these uh, Ottoman pipes. They're very rare, but they're, they're distinctly Russian, and you find these um, during that in the early 19th century. Um, Never, actually, most sites you'll find K1 pipes from England. Um, this is pretty unique, and it's, and it's like, I, I don't think we have enough time to go through everything. There's so much. I know. We need to keep moving. Keep trucking. <sighs> All right. You know. The, there's the Japanese coins. Uh, we know that the Clinket used Japanese coins in, uh, in their armor, right? Uh, but these are showing up at Castle Hill, which is really interesting, and this might link to the story of the, Japan, um, the Japanese... Uh, fishermen who were stranded here in, what was it, 1832? I can't remember, and it's in my notes Before here somewhere. 1850. Yeah. <laughs> um, we had phoenix buttons. That's what these things are with the American Eagle. These actually are manufactured in Britain, and they were given to the Prince of Haiti, and when he committed suicide, they were then given to uh, the trading post on the Columbia River, and then the only place outside of the Columbia River Basin that those show up is at Castle Hill. And we found six of these here. There's a tortoise shell comb. This um, fiber in the middle on the blue background is actually coconut husk, which is used for making um, rope. What else? Oh, Venetian beads. We can go on and on. We have a whole list. But, you know, we just don't have forever. So here we have that physical manifestation of that, what we know from the historic records, which is the, the company's interaction with the world system. Yeah. And, and basically, um, but these are just small little bit of items. I'm a specialist in pottery, and I'll tell you that when you're walking through town here, it, for me, I, I, I don't know, I don't want to leave because there's a whole story out there. <laughs> this whole story of the interaction of the Russian American company during the first half of the 19th century is literally in your gardens. Um, and I'm not, I don't have time to go through this. this is a whole paper in itself, but you might recognize some of these things. Now. The most, one of the most common uh, ceramics you can find in these workers' houses at Castle Hill and elsewhere in, in, the, um, in town is uh, the blue and white um, Canton porcelain. Produced in China, designed to be uh, sold cheaply on their end and then marked up by Americans and others. Um, it was a very high-class item around the world, but uh, in Russian America, everybody had it, which is an interesting question. We haven't answered why it was so cheap. I mean, we find this stuff from Kodiak Island to Sitka to the smallest little post on the Kenai River. Very interesting. Uh, a second variant um, only found in Russian America and only found in Sitka so far is this Chinese uh, worker's pottery from Manila. Uh, probably, again, um, equal in the, you know, availability was English Staffordshire China, um, which uh, the, doesn't really show up before 
1805 and other sites outside of New Archangel, but it starts showing up really, really a lot after about 1810 or so when the round the world voyages were taking off from Kronstadt. And going through the records, we find that Liverpool and Portsmouth uh, were major stops on the way out from the Baltics. And so they would pick up pottery from England and bring it here on those round the world voyages. Uh, an interesting sidebar. Uh, ceramics printed with American to patriotic scenes. These ceramics, like on the lower right, that's Lafayette at uh, Franklin's tomb, 1818. This was produced specifically in England for Americans to celebrate the new nation. And they're not found anywhere outside of the English seaboard, or I'm sorry, the eastern seaboard, except here. So this one in particular is that physical link between the Russian-American company and the American traders, the Bostonians that made up, basically they were the core of supply between about 1810 and 1835 or so. And it, from this, we now know that ceramics were part of those cargoes and they were traded directly to the Russians here. After 1840, the Hudson's Bay Company took a, a major role in supplying the colony. We've covered that a little bit, but uh, this is the best time marker we have for all of Russian sites. Um, Swode Copeland, Staffordshire, was um, this pottery that uh, the Hudson's Bay Company had, and the only company they would supply to all the HBC forts. And when the contract in 1839 through 1850 occurred with, uh, with Russia, Russian America, uh, this pottery just basically graced all the tables in town and, dis and then disappeared. And, and last but definitely not this. least, this is, you know, one of the things that, as a, somebody who studies ceramics, um, to find something nobody else has ever found before. Well, prior to this project in 1995, there had been four or five verified pieces of Russian ceramic found in North America, mostly at Fort Ross. Um, here we had dozens and dozens of individual vessels and I think close to 15 individual manufacturers of Russian porcelain. The finest porcelain produced in Russia. The Tsar used some of these companies, Gardner, uh, Terekov, and some others. Very, very fine porcelain, but this was found in the workers' housing. And it's also found in very remote posts. Um, it might be hand-me-downs. It could be hand-me-downs. Anyway, keep going. Uh, and also some work-a-day uh, Russian like uh, folk pottery, which is, I did a whole paper on myself. But again, in this Castle Hill collection was the first time we could track this huge part of Russian ceramic industry and how it came into Alaska. Okay. So, oh, so that I just uh, that's just like a glimpse of like the the global interactions that the Russian American company had. But I think a lot of times we get too focused on, on the Russian stuff. The, one of the key strategies in the success of the Russian American company was its, its use of established indigenous trade routes in, in, uh, in their trade relationships. So I just want to talk real briefly about this. Um, this is a map uh, from my own research. And what the, uh, I don't have a key, I'm sorry, but the red dots, illustrate places um, where there are known Russian um, artels or forts. I haven't sorted it yet by size of the fort. The uh, green circles are where traditional indigenous uh, trade fairs took place. And uh, the green triangles have to do with, with beads, so don't, don't worry about that. I wasn't going to talk about it anyway. So, there's these uh, indigenous trade routes, there's different varieties, but Alaska natives had already established when the Russians arrived these trade routes that crossed the Bering Strait, they went out into the Aleutian Islands, they go all the way uh, down southeast and the northwest coast into, into Washington and across the border into Canada. This is the territory of the indigenous people of Alaska and the trade routes that uh, were intricate and varied and the things that were traded across them. In fact, in fact, I've shown in, in some research I've done with beads that Alaska natives had access to Western goods before the Russians arrived. They had been, uh, they had been getting all sorts of resources through these trade routes. So they were savvy 
um, in, in trade, and they also already had a taste for the types of, of goods that the Russian-American company could supply for uh, a better trade exchange and, and uh, in more abundance. Uh, the point here, I guess, is that uh, Alaska Natives were part of the Paris of the Pacific. It's not just the Russians. And they were doing that either by trading furs and pelts uh, for food and clothing. They were providing watercraft and, and hunting, and then crafts as well to the Russian-American company. They also participated as employees, and we have evidence of that at Castle Hill. Here's some of that, just a little bit of what we found at the base of Castle Hill. Yeah, these were in the workshops, um, right along with the European goods and completely unexpected. Well, unexpected if one didn't understand the historic record. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> let's just look at a few of these. Just real quick, yeah, where's the pointer? Here we go. So, just to kind of give you an idea of where these come from. This is a, uh, this was a, is this a Russian ceramic, Dan? I can't remember. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, this is a Russian ceramic, and it's been repaired, um, which is, you see a lot, uh, the Yupik of Southwest Alaska will do this a lot with their ceramics. They'll drill it and when it breaks and then lash it together. This is lashed together with a piece of spruce root. This is the plug of spruce root that came out of that hole. This is a, a spruce root basket. It was filled with salmonberry seeds. These are Yupik gaming pieces made out of ivory. We've got Atna bangles made from copper. We've got, uh, this is a brown bear pendant, a polar bear with a seal riding its back. We have all of these projectile points. There's ground slate ones that come from Kodiak. We've got, uh, this is a ground slate one from Kodiak. These come from California. Yeah, that's right. You might be looking at this. This is just one fragment of uh, what you all should be familiar with, the raven's tail rope, which was probably the most amazing and valuable thing that we found. Twelve examples of this have been found in, uh, in our, uh, that exist. Twelve exist. This is the only one that's come from an archaeological site, and it came from this site. When we found this, Terry Rothkar happened to be at the site, and she cried. She recognized it. I'm getting teary just thinking about it. She, she recognized it right away. It was a really important moment because it's the first time she'd ever laid her hands on an authentic, um, you know, over 100-year-old raven's tail robe. And it was at that moment that she was actually trying to revitalize the weaving technique. It was a really special. Yeah, and there were unique we weaves she'd never seen before in this. So this really <sighs> was something. Gives me chills just thinking yeah. about it. So you can see there's all sorts of incredible, amazing stuff happening. How did this happen? Yeah, well, how did these artifacts from all over Alaska end up in these workshops? Labor practices, I think, are part of it, Dan, don't you think? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> the, they're not just establishing, the company isn't just establishing trade relationships with Alaska Native people. They're taking those, some of those people and they're training them in uh, and incorporating them into the Russian American company. And they relied on Alaska Native people and Creole people uh, in order to be a successful enterprise. Not all Russian American company workers were Russian. There were Finns, there were Germans, there were uh, Almost everybody was an Aleut. <laughs> um, there were uh, some Clinket employees, people from Kodiak Island. This is a, this is a list from uh, Tikmenev that uh, is from 1819. This is just uh, the people employed by the Russian American company in this community. And you can see uh, where these people come from all over the place. Kodiak, um, people from... No, this is over, overall. Oh, the this is overall. Next, You're right. Sorry, next, we'll one the next one is, is Sitka yeah. only. You're okay. right. Thank you. Forgive me. This is overall in, yeah. the, in the territory. Here's the list from, uh, from Sitka. This is a little bit more specific. We're really lucky that Wrangell kept track of some of these people. And what he did is he wrote down not just how many, how many people there were of different ethnicities, but also the types of jobs that they did. And the highlighted section here is what's key to our understanding about what's happening at Castle Hill, at the, in the workshops at Castle Hill, because that's the, that is the line uh, of people who were working in our workshops and living at the site. And you can see they're middle class people, which can be of any ethnicity. It doesn't just say Russian. Um, so those could be Germans, those could be Finns, and Creoles. Creoles are uh, uh, an important group of people. They're not, uh, in, the, in the Russian American context, real quick, they're not 
necessarily people only of mixed heritage. And they're not just people who are mixed Clinket and Russian. They could be Aleut and Russian. They could be all Aleut. And they've been raised and educated at the cost of the Russian American company. So they, a Creole is, a, is an economic or social status. It's not necessarily an ethnicity. So when we see lists of, like this of people doing different jobs, and almost all of these jobs are being performed by people of Creole status. That could be somebody from, from Paimute, that could be somebody from, which is in Southwest Alaska, that could be a Clinket person. That could be somebody from the Aleutian Islands, from the Pribilofs, from, from Kodiak. So just seeing that word Creole is a little bit, it's like, who is that exactly? Well, it was in front of us the whole time. Uh, if you've ever pawed through Klebnikov and all the wonderful uh, translated series that are out there, it, you know, where do you begin? Um, it was late in the stage, and between the, the, the tables that Margan um, found and this particular passage from uh, 1830, um, translated in 94, um, this was, talks specifically about the coppersmiths in Sitka. Specifically, with, of um, in where in at Castle Hill themselves, because Castle Hill was the coppersmith um, center here, so you can read the the passage. But by 1830, all the folks that were working in copper, be it smelting, casting, or far, uh, sheet metal work, uh, were what were called creoles. Right. And so it, at this point, you know, we connected the dots. You know, here what's, we have confirmed. What's a, what's a Creole? That's the question. What's a Creole? So were the Creoles working here Clinket in Russian? Or were, were they many different Alaska natives, um, possibly pure, uh, pure descended Alaska natives or people of mixed heritage? I think it's pretty clear. How, how does this Alaska Native stuff end up there? It has to do with people's connections to those places across the state. And those people are converging here in your home. Yeah, this was the Russian American company, if you think about it. They, they were the foundation. They were the very, the gears of industry. They were, the Russian American company didn't, was not blessed with labor from Russia. They relied heavily in some, on the backs, there's different ways to look at it, on Alaska natives. But, you know, I was just listening to a program on uh, NPR with Alan Boraz up in Kenai, and he was talking about the trans, the, after the American transfer and how the, the new government viewed natives. And I saw this amazing difference between how Russian America, or excuse me, the Russian American company engaged Creole people, and they were allowed to rise to middle and upper status positions in the commu community, the highly skilled craftsmen, et cetera. By the time the Americans came in, uh, the Creole word became half-breed and horrible, horrible terminology. And also, yeah. I've been looking at the Hudson's Bay Company during the Russian American period and the Northwest Company, uh, the fur trading ventures in Canada that stretch across. Creoles in the Métis of the Western um, provinces, they, were, they actually played a huge role in those companies too, but they had a ceiling. They were not allowed to rise above the assistants, the guides, the voyageurs. And so I think we have something very unique here in the Russian American company that's um, reflected here clearly. Right. I don't want to uh, make it seem like we're downplaying uh, the, the, basically how Aleut people and, and people from the Kodiak archipelago were enslaved, because basically that's what they were. Um, we're just talking about, you know, people who were engaged with the company in a more positive way. The, the topic of enslavement or, or uh, colonialism of the Aleuts is a whole other issue I could spend forever talking about. That's some of my research I've been doing, too. It's like the U.S. government. You know, you look at uh, the, cost, the period of the Constitution, and it was founded on slavery, but we still love our country. I love this history. It's just a very difficult, um, you know, series of events. Yeah. Right. Now, can we go back one more? And, uh, you know, in retrospect, too, now we look at this Raven's Tail Rope, and we say, well, how did that get in the... Uh, oh, right. We were talking about that. We have to finish with that. 
How did that get into the, the deposits? I mean, we talked about all the artifacts from Yupik territory, from, uh, you know, Adna, Anupiat. Um, go ahead, Morgan. The, <laughs> thank you, Dan. <laughs> The, you know, the Raven's Tail robe, the way... Uh, now, this is a story I've made up in my mind in a lot of ways, but, you know, you, you can argue with me about how, whether this might be factual or not. But uh, I, in my mind, what I imagine is that, you know, Raven's Tail robes were, were the early version of Chilcat blankets. And so a lot of the things that the Clinket do now with uh, Chilcat blankets, they did with Raven's Tail robes. They took hundreds and hundreds of hours. They're more labor-intensive than making a Chilcat robe, even. And um, one of the things they would do is they would, uh, somebody who was very rich and having a potlatch would take these and cut them into pieces and then hand them out. Um, so to receive part of a raven's tail, even part of a raven's tail robe was a sign of great honor during a potlatch. This is somebody saying, thank you so much for what you've done for me. I honor you, right? And imagine, here's, you know, probably, most likely a Creole person, maybe even somebody who's Aleut and Russian, who's living in Clinket territory, and they've been invited to attend a, a potlatch of a very influential person, Clinket person, and they're given part of a raven's tail robe. Or somebody who was orphaned um, and being educated by the Russian American company and was working at the Hill and then still maintained their ties to the Clinket community and are invited to a potlatch and given part of a raven's tail rope. This is something that they would have va uh, valued a lot. It, it's, a, it's really an amazing thing to find. Just to, oh, yeah, we so can't special. put names. We can, we'll never be able to find out who lived in these houses, but we, I think we have a face to it now. I mean, I think we have a real visceral feeling for, in, in, in it's archaeology, but it's also a historic record. I mean, we think we know who lived here. And this is, this is Sitka. This is yeah. Sitka 1830. That's just amazing. It just uh, gives me, I just love it. Love it so much. We, we had a few other things. If we had time, blah, blah, blah. You saw this already. We need to put this up real quick. We did not list everybody in the acknowledgments because honestly this was 20 years of, of labor, sweat, and tears and so you can't do that. But we wanted to make sure that we uh, acknowledge that the state of Alaska and the you know, uh, oil companies who help pay uh, you know, indirectly for this project and Dave McMahon who we all love and adore. Jeff, Jeff and the Historical Society, thank you for having us. Questions please. Oh yes, does anybody, ha we have time for questions hopefully? Oh yay. Yeah, should I like go over with the mic? You, here, I'll come, so you guys can hear, yeah? Is that okay, do you mind? Okay, great. On your uh, chandelier photo, and then they had the Samsonoff uh, piece of pottery with that green tint in it, and that, is that like a, a dated thing? Like on that color green ink on that, is that like come from Russia? If, or? if you have a piece of pottery that's uh, porcelain, white porcelain, finely gray, um, and you could show it to me, I could tell you the answer, but otherwise, the color itself, um, it could vary. Depend if it is porcelain, though, and it's an overglaze, da da da. When are you leaving? Tomorrow, but I, I mean, I think I invited, we invited folks to uh, actually meet up with us if you have questions, because we... 417, Catlian, I can show you a beach full of pottery and all yeah. different kinds, and my family has all the cool pieces, just a couple houses from where I live, and one of them is a little uh, English, but it's uh, an orange marmalade jar that I found intact. This is just a little thing, but made to poor Richard's almanac standards, you know, but green ones. And I know if you went down to that beach with a gooey duck pump and just turned it over, you'd get buku stuff out of it. It's the last undisturbed beach where canoes used to haul out. So I'm going to find you tomorrow because I need help in Absolutely. what I'm trying to do. I'd Thank love you. to. That'd be fun. Yeah, we, we have so many ideas, and you know, you guys live here. We have lots of thoughts. Uh, we would love some time to come back, if anybody wants to, to organ help us organize it or, or something, to come back and do like an antiques roadshow type thing, because everybody has stuff, right? I mean, geez, Nancy, we spend so much time talking, right? Um, 
you know, to, uh, to, to you know, help people try to figure out what's in your garden, right? And another uh, thing we'd like to encourage is a community-based archaeology project where, uh, where people, um, the whole community uh, pulls together and we do archaeological excavations with land, private landowners and try to figure out where different things are found in the community. Where's the Russian stuff? Where's the Clinket stuff? You know, where were the Aleut houses that they talk about in the descriptions? Where, where are things scattered throughout the community? Because everything here is archaeological. It's everywhere. Yeah. Is there any other questions? Oh, yes. Here, I'll bring you. Do you mind? Do you mind? OK, great. So where are the artifacts stored currently? Yeah, good question. Do you want to? Do you want me? You? Go ahead. Me? You? Me? Um, so. Great question. Yeah. The uh, Raven's Tail Robe and a few other items are at the State Museum in Juneau. Uh, and people can go look at the Raven's Tail Robe. You need special permission from the curator to do that, but it's possible. And then the rest of the artifacts are in Anchorage. Um, the state has finally found the funding to send it to the museum in Fairbanks. So that's, I know, <laughs> it's so far away. Yeah, but, um, but so all the artifacts, they're, they're in the final process of sending it to Fairbanks. I, but, uh, may I interject? It's too big of a collection to send to the state museum in Juneau. Uh, they just don't have the space for it. it. You know, it's a half million artifacts. It's, what is it, a hundred and something boxes, boxes. It takes boxes. up half a warehouse. But the, the good news about the Museum of the North is that they offer loans to any community for their archaeology materials. So you could ask and get a loan from the Museum of the North for Sitka, whoever you are. The and they'll ship Sitka they'll historical, stuff yeah, they'll ship to it. Sitka for people here for to For years, at. potentially. Or decades for a display or something. So, so you can't, we, it could be arranged to get a, a permanent loan. In fact, some of the artifacts uh, uh, were in display. I don't know if they're still are. We haven't gotten down to the totem park. Um, but there were some on display at the park service down there in the museum. A little tiny display of some of, actually, some of the ivory carvings. Yeah. More, oh, great. I'm coming to you. If you don't, oh, okay. Do you want to talk into this? Or? Okay. okay. Um, out at Redoubt, there is a stream that's not part of the falls out at Redoubt, and there are shards in the stream, uh, dishes, pieces of dishes. Would they be Russian or would they be uh, American? Brennan's right or? there. You were out there. Yeah, some, some of them are. Uh, I didn't see any Russian material, but they're. Chinese porcelain and um, uh, blue and white transfer printed pearlware, which is, or no, actually it's whiteware, so it's English. English, uh huh. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. He, so he said that uh, the porcelains or the ceramics out there are, are English mostly, you said, right? There's, there's quite a bit of Chinese porcelain. Oh, Chinese porcelains as well, yeah. I know uh, there's, some, there's some people stirring pot to get out there, right? Give me. What, Hal? Yeah, <laughs> no, no, she was observing. She's, she's making yeah. note, mental note, of where to find cool, see cool stuff. Right. When you go out to readout, um, you can take fish, you can take berries, but don't take the artifacts. Leave them. <laughs> That's what Hal wants to remind everybody. Did you have a question? I wonder if you could pull up a slide. That showed foreign coins that you oh. found. You sure. Yeah. He wants to see the coins. Oh, holy! Uh, yeah. That's one way to do it. Yep. There. No, oh, that oh. was not it. This is it. This is it. Well, Lower. no, I think he wanted to see the Japanese one. Oh, this one. Okay. The, the, on the left is. Those are the Japanese coins. Yes, sir. There. One in the center there is Chinese. Uh, it's Chinese. You're a coin collector. We need yeah, to talk. <laughs> okay. Ah. Oh, cool. Those, so you okay, great. I had probably 20 or 30 of them in my pocket. <laughs> they are definitely Chinese. Chinese. All right. I think we had a... I think we had a Japanese uh, coin expert look at them, and he actually told us the dates. 
It's, I don't have that here. It's, it's, I wrote it down. In case somebody asked, what? Where is that? Here. No. So much information. Okay. Where was Do it? you have any more questions while we're looking this up? Sure, come on. Go ahead. Uh, somebody else had to uh, field this question. I don't know that. Anybody else? Historian here? Jen Young? <laughs> They're not Japanese. Those in the center there are Chinese. Okay. That's right. Rations of alcohol, yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah. I'm curious. I'm curious, oh. I'm curious where, the, where the quote came from, Paris of the Pacific, and what year it was, was quoted. Do you guys know? The, the Klebnikov one? Oh, well, I've seen uh, that. The, the, the yeah. one that we had up on the slide? No, the actual terminology, Paris of the Pacific. Yeah, no, that oh. shows up a little later. Oh. But I just was reading about that, and I will try to find that. But it's not an American modern coin, coin term. It dates to the Russian period. It was somebody who visited. Jinya, <laughs> where is she? She must know. Jinya, do you remember where the Paris of the Pacific, that, that name for Sitka comes from? That was somebody who visited in the Russian period, yeah? You don't remember either. Yeah. I, I, yeah. <laughs> That's a great question, though. That is, yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure we all knew at one point, but yeah, there's so much to know, right? <laughs> was it the Paris of the Pacific? That's what you know. You have to ask yourself. Was Sitka the Paris of Alaska? Think about that. Paris of Alaska, for sure. With all the native people here, indigenous <laughs> people. It's a different way to look at it. Oh, it's, yeah. Are there more questions? Yes, ma'am. Do you want to talk into the mic? Or? I guess I don't have a question, but maybe to go back to that bathhouse picture. The bathhouse please. So uh, um, I was born and raised here in Sitka. I'm half Clinket and I'm half Creole from Kodiak. Cool. I wasn't prepared to come here and speak. I was just curious, but I would just say that that bathhouse in that circle, there's a replica, or not a replica, but a log house exactly like that in Kodiak um, in Alatak that my great great uncle, who was Russian, had built for the owners of the Columbia Ward Fisheries. And the owner of that um, Columbia Ward Fisheries hired my great great uncle. Um, it, my mother's from Kaguyak. The village was lost in 1964. My mother grew up in Kaguyak in the middle of the village because she was half more Russian than Alutik. And her relatives were here not to enslave the Alutik, but to learn from them and that they were um, learning from each other. There was no term for slaving. They were translating and learning from each other. My mother still owns the holy picture that her great-great-grandfather brought from Kodiak, or from Russia. And my, my two times great-grandfather came from Russia to help expand the Orthodox Church. His sons went to the Pribilovs, some stayed in Kodiak, and another son came here. And my, my mother's grandfather lost what happened with his brother in Sitka. And when she came here for Edgecombe High School, she was instructed by her uncle to look for the memorial marker for her great uncle. Never found him. And she spent many years looking for his marker. And the year before the Nakahiti house was built, 
we were doing dance shows in this building for a Sitka tribe, and a man came off of the cruise ship looking for my mom's great uncle and uh, found out he was a descendant and had all the history, and that great uncle was a... Um, accountant for the fur trade and had gone down to California and she, and she he had all the uh, information but um, it's been very very interesting to hear your presentation I also wanted to say about that um, I didn't know what you called it if you could go back to where they were the little miniature icon uh, bracelet or pieces that up there, I still carry that because my mom told me that, and we were all raised to carry the little picture with us, and that's part of the Orthodox uh, religion that I was raised with. It's just always with you. You're a guardian angel, and I learned that from um, Anna uh, when I found a picture, a new one that I could carry with me. Thank you. Oh, I wanted to share about the hair in the bathhouse. So my mom was um, also trained that when they um, were growing up that you never threw your body parts. You, you, when a baby was born, their umbilical cord, their hair, their nails, everything that they, their clothing, they were, they were um, never just tossed about because they were told that you would be wandering the world looking for your parts and you wouldn't be able to move to the next spirit world until you got all of those so they would take them to their they called it banya the bathhouse and they would be burned in the um, bath steam so I wanted to share what I had that was fascinating thank you thank you so much you're uh, the embodiment of everything yeah we thank you so much that was great <sighs> All right, uh, I guess more? we're uh, uh, we're out of time. Hal is like pulling out the hook. Oh, oh, Nancy has a question. Do you have a yes, Miss Nancy? If you can come back, I have boxes of Sitka-owned porcelain artifacts, rocks, stone tools that are from Baranoff Street. They're from Pacific High, uh, where the Russian hospital was. And they're from hmm, 706 and Jeff Davis, Indian River, uh, and Dog Creek. And they're, some of them are privately owned and others are really Sitka owned. And if they had your professional attention, it would give us a comparative basis for our shared histories, layers and layers of shared histories. So that's sort of what I, I would love to see you come back in with your, your expertise and the expertise of a lot of people here in town. They are so knowledgeable. And what fun to have Martha Melovidoff, Vera Melovidoff, oh from Kukuyak just brings back memories and the links across the Pacific, the links from one community to another, the mobility of people on those kayaks in the Umiaks. It's just, uh, we're just, it's just a little bit that we uh, have an understanding. But what fun in our shared humanity, our shared Sitka. Thank you both for coming and uh, Let's get together again, folks. This is just the beginning. If you really uh, want to bring your stuff out tomorrow. Yeah, we're here. We, we, I think we could do it. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. it, it just privately, uh, anybody who's interested in having us look at some things, we, I'd be, I'm uh, volunteering myself. I'd love to. We have a few hours tomorrow. Well, how about 1 o'clock in one of the centennial rooms or the library? Uh, let's talk after the Oh, OK. Meeting. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We don't know what, we don't want to like say, let's be here and then it not be available. Yes, yeah. that's right? true. Yeah. But thank you again. We, we, uh, <laughs> we do have, uh, I, I have my um, card if anybody wants to mull things over. I don't know. Because um, we're married, so it kind of like, if you email me, I can pass it to him or I don't know, whatever. I just want a card. 
Oh, okay. oh well, yeah. We also we also take requests. People can send pictures. Uh, hopefully, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you so much.